Hi, welcome to 2020. It's certainly been a different year this year and um, it's a little bit harder to have a normal family reunion. So um, Uncle Bill and Helen and Shane have up the idea that uh, they do it online, which is a great idea. So uh, keep everyone safe. So we just thought we'd have to share a few minutes of uh, what our connection with the family reunion has been over the years and, um, and hopefully that's a little bit to the, the day. Um, it, our first interaction, I suppose, was uh, we always knew Uncle Bill and Auntie Murray were really keen, keen to keep the family history and find out as much as they can about the um, English side as they could and connect the, um, the people who lived in Australia now together. So um, that was a good thing. But um, in 1987, we had the opportunity to travel overseas. And uh, from that, the interest, I suppose, stemmed. Uncle Bill said to us, um, would you mind taking some photos of the little village called Pointington when we're over there? And we thought, yep, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, we can do that all via a little map and um, and go from there sort of thing. So that was about six months before we headed off to England. So of course we wanted to gather a little bit more information and and learn what we could find. So the first thing was to buy a really good AA map, and uh, we found Pointington on this little map. Well. Uncle Bill and Auntie Mario were, were as excited as we were and uh, and our little um, interest in trying to find this community um, and take a few pictures for Uncle Bill, um, that really developed then. Um, we actually went down to Ballarat and caught up with uh, Florence Chuck. She was a, a family, I suppose, family history lady um, and she knew a bit about the ships that had come out at the time um, and so she sort of pointed us in the direction and, and uh, gave us some information sort of prior to uh, much as far as laptops and things. We actually got to hold documents that were hundreds of years old um, when we did our study. So um, she gave us, pointed us into, I guess, into the direction of where the records offices were. Um, Fortunately, we, we were able to get back to... 1680. Before we left, we knew that there's three, these three brothers had come out from us, um, England and their parents' name, but we end up getting back about four or five generations before that. So um, we, one of the interesting things was a lot of people would just research the names, but it wasn't really the names that inter interested us. It was more the, the stories behind the names, and we were able to see letters that were, were written about our family, um, parts of the uh, church community they were in, uh, the paintings they took out, and different things of what they owned and the land they uh, were on. And it was really exciting to see that as a, um, it was like nearly being there without them being there sort of thing. And we saw the, you know, the chest tomb of the, of the church and, and things like that, which were really exciting to say, look, this is where our family um, came from. And, and then I suppose it did, brought up the thing, well, why did they come to Australia? So um, that was all put together. And um, fortunately, we were, they stayed in the area for about 200 years in this Pointington area, which is only a very small village, only about 200 people in this area. Um, and it was very lucky that they'd been staying there and we could follow them through. Uh, and it was just a, a lot of other people didn't have that uh, luxury, I suppose, of, knowing that that person was actually related to them and, and being loaders, you know, it was it, quite a common name in that area and to link those names and the families together was um, quite exciting for us. So um, it was good that, that all that over that time they've been involved in farming. Um, so I suppose that's a, a bit of a link today, like there's a lot of farmers out there. Um, and they, the other thing that was interesting is they were quite involved in the church and there was cases case of um, they, that they didn't actually mind standing up for the underdog sort of thing. So um, there was a lady in 1894, Ann Loder, so she was the um, mother, the grandmother of the ones who come out, no, sorry, the mother who the ones who come out the year. And she had a bit of an argument with the church at the time and they were talking about a footpath being in the wrong place and how come the church paid for it and all that sort of stuff. But at the end of it, she paid off 15 pounds for the, um, it was, the poor people of the Pointington, and virtually they said at that time, if she, um, if she, well, that 15 pounds that she paid off would have paid for the labourer's family and the, uh, their food and the rent for the whole year. So she just pulled out of the pocket and said, look, there's 15 pounds to pay off the, the parish poor. And to me, it was 
sort of the sign of that hey she was um a good lady even though she did have debates with the church um she was on the right side of things so um yeah it was just interesting times so um we we got to learn about these record officers and uh, um i was working as a as a secretary at the time in a temp capacity so um we we were blessed to move not too far from Flemington, only about an hour's drive um, for six months with Malcolm's work. They'd asked him, is there any way anywhere in particular that you guys would like to live and work? Um, and Malcolm had just mentioned this uh, Pointington that we'd love um, to get down there at some point and take some photos. Um, little did we know, but there was a, a building site that they wanted Malcolm to help uh, repair some of the uh, issues of the previous site manager. And so, he worked down there um, for a time, which meant we got to live literally about uh, five minutes walk from the nearest records office, which was the records office for Pointington and for much of where um, the load of family history worked. So being a temp secretary, if I didn't have work, I'd actually go to the records office and I'd do some research for that six months um, on those days when I wasn't working. Um, and and it was so amazing because the team there, they were so excited about these Aussies coming to find out research and they worked with us, you know. Um, of course, before the days of computers, uh, or well, sorry, not before computers, but as far as uh, family history programs and things. So we had the good old card file boxes um, and I'd do a heap of research in, in a day and then we'd get home and uh, Malcolm would have these uh, card files like jigsaw puzzles all over the floor, um, trying to piece together and see where he could match someone and get some consistency. So we had quite a, a thorough system there um, to try and get it um, that we could see what was going on. Um, it was it was uh, really, really a special time and um, living so close to the records office. And then also, of course, our, our weekends, we could get down to Pointington and go to church. They had a church service once a month down there. So we'd get down there um, and also um, we had an amazing privilege of getting to know some of the families, um, you know, so um, with some of the farmland that had been um, with the dairy farmers, we got to know um, those guys and spend time with them, have meals with them. Um, and one dear lady, Mrs. Cook, um, she was the elder of the church whilst we were there and she was a very beautiful, proper lady and uh, we, we got to know her quite a bit and uh, one time when we were talking, I said, well, it's funny, Pointington don't have any signs um, and because um, I just thought it'd be nice to take a photo of a sign and uh, and she said, oh, there aren't any signs and, and she jokingly said, I'll have to see what I can do about that. But sure enough, the next time we got back to Pointington, um, there were these signs. She'd gone and spoken to the council and uh, within it's, it, it's not good enough. They don't come from Australia to find the village. We can't find the village. It's not good so, three, three signs later, yeah, the, yeah, were, so. yeah. so it's pretty cool. So you'll see those pictures in the book, and um, it, and it was really special. But uh, I, I guess um, more special was um, the, those relationships, getting to know them. And uh, I was just going to say about the sorry. Yeah, I was going to mention about the uh, the church bells. That'll come a bit later in my notes. Sorry. Um, yeah, so um, in 1770, um, Caleb Loder, um, he was involved in the church. And so um, at the time when the, the, the new church bell was being cast, um, because he was part of the, the, uh, the leadership team of the church at the time, his name's actually cast in that bell. And uh, dear Mrs. Cook, who I'd mentioned, um, who who we adored, she she said to us, she's a very proper, beautiful lady, and she said, you have to you have to wear some old clothes because there's a lot of spider webs, and uh, it's going to be a messy day, she said. So we go in what we call old clothes, um, and we get there, and dear Mrs. Cook, she looks like she'd just come from the hairdressers. And in clothes that we'd probably wear to a wedding, no, not quite, but but just nearly. And uh, and off we off we toddled. We we climbed up this old staircase um, with such an excitement, um, and no one had been up there for many many years. And uh, 
it was a really special day um, when yeah. I think back of it um, and climbing these stairs and clearing spider webs. The interesting thing was that there's three church bells in that church and the, the church bell with Kale, which is the grandfather of the ones who came out to Australia, was cast in 1770 and the other bell was 1595 and the other one was predated that. So like when we looked at it we thought, 1770 it was fairly significant for Australia. That was Captain Cook, you know, discovered Australia, it officially known sort of thing. Um, but it, the, virtually the church was four, four times as old as that. So there's parts of it was 12th century. So the history of the place is um, oh, it's just sort of overwhelming when you're there, when you see things with 800 years old and still there. You know, in Australia, we look at things and it's 100 years old, we better knock it down nearly, um, or it's falling down anyway. Um, so the history is still there. So. Yeah, so so with the church bell, once you got to this church bell, of course we all had lunch up there, and uh, but with the church bell we'd been told before, um, you get some chalk and, and lightly um, go over the, I guess, the inscription on the bell. Um, so you'll notice that in the book as well. Um, and, and it was really cool because, um, just like Malcolm said, seeing those bells, um, was really quite remarkable and and to know the involvement of those guys in the church over many many years um, was so special inside the church is there's a plaque there little brass plaque probably about a four size and um, it, it's written in latin which you obviously can't read unless you can read latin but um, we'd seen it there and it, we could pick out that it said something about loader so we looked up and there's a lot of good records um uh, cyrus photos and things like that but it was put up um, by Mary Liddell, who's a loader, she was a cousin of the ones who came out to Australia, by her ex or her husband when she died, and it said on there, um, in memory of uh, Mary Liddell, part of an old family who settled in Pointington. It showed that, um, to me, that it was real value, even though she'd gone and moved into actually in, into London, lived in there for many years before she'd passed away. Um, that the, the history and the connection of the land was still there and that she valued that she didn't just pack up and leave, that she actually valued the connection of the land. And the, the, I suppose the, um, the, the family who was there, you know, for the 200 years before. So um, in, on the front of our book, uh, if you get a chance to have a look at the book, on the bottom left-hand corner is a chest tomb. And obviously there's not uh, 13 people buried in this chest tomb, but there's a, it, it did show a... Um, I suppose strength and a value that you can actually afford a chest tomb. And there was 13 names in this um, on this chest tomb. And a lot of the names you can't see today, you can just see letters. And what they do is to um, to highlight these names. They'll put a black cloth over the chest tomb and then they'll shine a, line, a light across the side of it. And they'll actually, you can actually pick out the imperfections or um, of the sand. Because a lot of the thing about it's like it started in, uh, 1774 so it's been down a long time but even though it's been down a long time a lot of probably history has been recorded but you can actually see some of the letters and with this recording and it was like a um, to us a revelation of, of the connections of the people who went down the lines before that they're really names that we we were you know 90% sure that they were connected but you can never really be sure but as soon as you see it on the chest tomb it sort of becomes fact so um, for those who are doing family history at all, really, you know, there's a lot of organisations out there putting up information, but it's really hard to guarantee how factual it is. And um, they'll take information off information off information. Eventually, it'll have something on a web page or whatever. So just be really guarded, I suppose, about assumptions about how families are connected and things like that. And um, we've seen different documents. There was, um, different spellings of different names in the same document, like the priest was writing out, there's Eliza Hayden, H-A-Y-D-E-N, and she and it wrote down as A-D-E-N, because um, that's the way she spoke. And um, there's other things, there's one of our families, we had Sarah loaded, well, we'd seen that there was three Sarah, or two Sarahs had died, uh, in, died in infancy, and then there was a third Sarah who lived. So they were spaced out over, the three births were spaced out over three or four years. But the dates, if you're not sure and if you don't pick up all the information, you can really throw you out. Mm -hmm. So, um, the yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, cross-referencing, make sure you're all right. Um, 
we were lucky because the, the, a lot of the church records uh, were intact back up to the 1680 where they're in Pornicton and uh, fortunately uh, for some like for us we were able to track that back to that 1680 but a lot of the other um, churches during the world uh, second world war were bombed and burned and there's a lot of records destroyed and they'd actually taken a lot of records to uh, London for safekeeping in a place called Somerset House and um, unfortunately that was too was bombed so a lot of records did get destroyed and once they're gone they're gone sort of thing and um, there was not you know, think about the options to you know have records there wasn't there wasn't libraries a lot of flash libraries or things like that it was virtually the church or this record office so um, it was lucky that we were able to go back and and actually guarantee that the information we had was good enough to put into a book um, Interesting though, we did find something just recently there was, um, which was new, which I hadn't discovered just until a couple of weeks ago. And we'd always known that there was an Edward who um, came out to Australia, or was on his way to Australia in 1876, and he was a cousin of the three brothers who came out. At that time, he was 21, and it said, uh, We'd found when we were in England, lost at sea, in, um, lost at sea on the way to Melbourne. That was about as much as we had. And then just recently, we, um, I looked it up again, I thought, Oh, the ship Great Queensland, which was actually um, it, it had been a freight ship which was carrying freight out to Australia, but also they take bring passengers out. And at the time um, when it got lost, there's more information there come up on the internet and it said uh, it disappeared. But four months later, the lifeboat was found off the coast of Spain. And at the time, it was carrying 34 tonnes of gunpowder, along with um, I think it's 2,600 tonnes of other supplies. But they didn't know what happened. They just found the lifeboat, nothing else. But there were 66 passengers and crew on board and all perished. And they put it down to spontaneous combustion in this gunpowder. They couldn't find anything else. So um, things might still come out in the future with the uh, internet, but the, the information has got to come from somewhere. So um, yeah, I think we've, we've covered it well a long time ago, but um, hopefully um, you know, we, we may be able to confirm things in the future. Um, the other thing was, a, uh, ones who didn't come out here, they were still actively involved in the church and in the, um, in doing good. There was a, another Caleb load, and there was, I think there's 11 or 12 the Caleb's um, in the, our history, um, but another Caleb load, it was a brother, brother of those who travelled to Australia, and he set up a, what they call it Agricultural Reform Association. And that was virtually a, a union, I suppose, for farmers or for people who were, a lot of at that stage there was a lot of people um i suppose you could say peasant farmers but there was a lot of people who had leased the land and didn't actually own the own the land and they'd been on the land for years and years and then um they'd get they get a hard time and then they get kicked off and there's one case with this Caleb took on uh, board which was in the 1870s and it was he took on board on behalf of the farm and you could pay a registration fee and um and have your case heard by this Caleb and he would then um, try and promote it and try and get a rightful uh, decision made. And at the time, there was letters, we watched letters, it was about over 12 months, and basically what happened, this farmer got, it sowed all his land down the crop and uh, and put all this money into pits and fences and things like that, and then just about to harvest it. And the, um, the Lord of the Manor at that time, for some reason, decided he was going to kick him off. So kicked him off and virtually the Lord of the Manor harvested it. And, they were claiming 60 pounds, which was virtually the, um, the I suppose, the years, um, I think it was 30, 40 acres or something like that, but it, with years income virtually um, gone. So this um, Caleb took him, virtually took him to court. But at the, at the time, the, um, the Lord of Manor's uh, lawyer said, don't worry about that Caleb loader. He's as mad as a hatter um, and he's got no, no impact at all. But over the course of the year, um, we watched letters going back and forth about, you know, the wrongful dismissal of this um, this tenant farmer. And, and this Caleb has written in a letter and he said he had more to do with the bill to protect the farmers than 10,000 lawyers in the country. And from that day, they, they, they introduced the farmer's bill, which virtually protected the farmers and said, look, if you put a crop in, you put so much money into it, you're entitled to compensation. So, and then at the end of it, this, um, this farmer, uh, he got 60 pounds compensation and also his, his, uh, his lease was renewed, so he's back on to the farm again. So 
it was the only case we saw, but I thought it was just a, it was just a thing for really hiding from the underdog and that he was a good bloke to you know to have on side sort of thing. So. Um, there, there are a lot of Caleb's you'll notice in the family history, and we actually have one of those Caleb's. Um, we love the, the biblical name, but we love the fact that there are so many of the loaders who are Caleb. So um, continuing that through um, when we were blessed to have our first boy, um, we have a Caleb. Um, now, another Caleb, back back many years ago, um, I mentioned that six months when I would go and do some research um, when I wasn't working. Um, this particular day, we've been through books upon books. I've searched out all sorts of things. And, and the, the oh, same sorry. guy who had the Reform Association, so he's heavily involved in the land as well. So, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and this Caleb, he, um, he we, we'd done a lot of research on many of the families. Um, and we, we looked up, I'd searched every book we could find with a mention to Loader. Um, we'd found birth dates, we'd found information that they'd done. And this particular day, I just felt, no, I'll just go back just for, you know, in case there's anything I've missed. And I, I said to the team there, hey, you know, is there any other books, whatever? And we went through another list of information and it, and it mentioned Loader in the, in the name of some machinery. And I said, oh, would that be, you know, one of the Loaders and, and the lady who ran that centre, you know, the records office, she said, no, 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 that'll be because it's about being a hay loader. And I said, look, it's my last chance to be here before we move. Um, I'll just check it just to be sure. And and sure enough, she got this book out and she sat with me. Um, and it was just such an incredible privilege. We were just both blown away um, when we just discovered that Caleb, Lo Caleb Loader just he he designed and made um, a hay loader, um, and be it that it's an early one, it's still similar, quite similar to the basic working mechanisms of it. Is quite similar, I think, to what you see today in hay loading machines. And uh, so, of course, that sent us on a completely um, fresh search, I guess, um, to go to different records offices. We, um, we had a time when Malcolm was working in London. Um, and so I went and checked out some of those offices and we were able to get a hold of all sorts of documents of, of the first plans. We got to see the results of when he first showed it. Um, he took it to a, an agricultural show and the, and the first year, the uh, I guess the reviews were not so grand because uh, apparently he'd uh, got a bit excited and perhaps uh, gone and displayed it uh, before too much uh, practice had occurred. And so um, the, the comment in the comment was, um, it's an in, ingenious contrivance, but <laughs> it's a pity that the, um, oh, the poor man hadn't taken more time in private before he exhibited in public. So, um, and then, but then the next year, it's, it went on to say, oh, improvement. considerable improvement yeah. on the showing last year, and um, I was sort of wishing well for the future sort of thing. But we, it had prices on different machines when he. Um, the different machine, like the light, the load apart, and the, the wagon went went alongside it, and it was at the time you could actually buy them for 20, 30 pounds. Um, but and it was produced by Rushton and Potter, which, which was the, at that stage was a uh, big company who was doing steam engines. So I suppose they'd be looking at things to you know, diversify and things. But we didn't, we couldn't actually find where they they actually produced any. Uh, had the price tag and had the, where they're going to be made, but we never actually able to find. Photos when you made, or none that were um, around in museums or anything like that. It wasn't long afterwards, so there was other people sort of come, and there's some I think come from America. It was probably five years later, and these were sort of the next version. So with the uh, overrunning and uh, or taking his ideas and painting things afterwards, we don't know um, or bought him out. Who knows? Um, but we never actually saw any of his machines as such where they were made or not. So. Um, it, yeah, it was just interesting. He laid he then stayed in the area for um, about another ten to fifteen years, and then he disappeared. So he would have been uh, probably about sixty or seventy uh, when he disappeared. So whether he passed away or not, we're not sure. But um. uh -huh. so uh, we we then uh, got back talking with Uncle Bill and Auntie Mari about all of this information we found, and 
um, and and it took it took a few years to get to the point that we, we together we all said hey well let's let's put together a bill, book and uh, and I think um, Uncle Bill sort of worked worked on us and said no no you can guys it, it'll be good it'll be good we'll work together um, and so we did the English side and Uncle Bill and Ali Mara did the Aussie side and of course Shane and Helen did a heap as well they did all all of the entry of the names and so much of that work and uh, so it was a real privilege just to to kind of pull it all together at that time to um, just to share uh, I guess a little of what we had um, had the privilege of finding out you know um, walking along those streets um, with some of the farmers and and just seeing where where the loaders lived what they did um, that was really really incredibly special for us um, sometimes on the on the Sunday after church there, we would uh, go and sit up on the hill or, um, you know, just to take more photos or just to, you know, just just sit and, and uh, you know, just enjoy our lunch together there. And um, it, it was really, really special. And uh, and we hope that, that I guess, in the, in the book, it just shows a little bit of that, what we what we found, what we learned, and about the beautiful Loder family. Um, it's interesting. There's about 3,000 names in the book, and... And a lot of those, you know, obviously passed away. But um, I think the the thing that remains the same. You know, a lot of people um, from the stories way, way back, you know, from 1680, um, there, you know, there's a lot of people who are good people. You know, they're uh, from the ones we found were, you know, church people, as you say, they're involved in the land, were looking after the poor people. And I think that um, background, you know, we can all be proud of it um, for the future. And, um, yeah, just thanks, Uncle Bill and Aunty Murray. They, they were huge in getting this together. And for me personally, it's uh, um, something I look back in and say, look, I've achieved that. You know, helped a little part in um, achieving to get a book together. You know, uh, when we went over, it's like, oh, let's take a few photos and I'll get two or three photos. That was sort of the start of it. But uh, actually, in the book, there was 500 copies um, printed, and we end, end up with um, another 140, which was sort of like the overrun. So. 640, and most of those have been now out into um, the load, so they're not sitting in boxes. I think Uncle Bill might have a few left, but there's probably over 600 sold into the uh, family. So um, it's interesting. I started uh, a new job at the start of the year, and we got talking to a, a distant load, and he said, oh, you want to get into one of these books? They're really good. You, you might see your, your name in there. It's like, oh, which books are those? And, oh, they've got a yellow card cover and things like that. So and he said, well, actually, uh, we're help you know, a small part in putting that together. So he was quite excited. And, and it does keep people connected. And, um, yeah, it's just a great honour. So um, thanks for watching. Um, hopefully this year's, you know, the first of the last. Hopefully next year we can get back to a bit of normality and have a, a family reunion. But um, if not, well, um, it is what it is. And we just um, thank you for watching this time. And, um, yeah, and thanks, Uncle Bill. Aunty Mary and Shane and Helen for um, their commitment and um, keeping this going. So.